Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 37 of the Retro Rents Retro Gaming Podcast. I am Al, and as you have guessed, because we're not playing the intro music, this means it's another special episode, and it's another interview. I've sat down myself, and Nick actually sat down and interviewed Lori and Corey Cole, the creators of the Quest for Glory series, uh, the creators of the amazing Hero You. Uh, Corey worked on Castle of Dr. Brain. Uh, they're, they're incredible figures in the gaming industry. I've always wanted to sit down and talk with them, the Quest for Glory series being one of my favorite series of all time. And Hero U is just as damn good and a wonderful spiritual successor. So I ask if you enjoyed this interview, and if Hero U sounds intriguing, uh, please go out and buy it. It is an amazing game, and it deserves to be played by everybody who remotely enjoys their work. I uh, hope everybody enjoys the interview as much as I did, and we'll see you all next time on the next episode of the Retro Rents. much for you know taking time out of busy schedules to um sit down and and talk with me and nick i i really do appreciate that Um, that's our pleasure really we love doing this that's part of the you know the pleasure of the job Uh, that means a lot because i'm uh, to be honest with you this is uh this is the craziest kind of dream come true for me so i'll try not to squee too much and and fanboy out here (laughs) (laughs) Uh, if, if only squeeze were dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, right? <laughs> yeah, we'd all be rich. No kidding. I don't know. You guys more than me, for sure. At least if mine counted. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so... I, you know, I was gaming from a very young age. I mean, I'm in my late 30s now. But uh, I remember clearly playing um, Heroes Quest for the first time on my friend's Amiga 500, and uh, I, if there was one game that just that totally hooked me into that genre and, and RPGs in general, it was the Quest for Glory series. And um, I mean, you guys have that. You have that's a huge credit. You did uh, Castle of Doctor Brain, uh, which I also played. Uh, genre, um, I, I played that a bit, I think, I don't remember if I got that at the time, but one thing I have played a lot of, and I was actually up till three in the morning playing it, was Hero U. Um, good lord. Well, awesome! <laughs> uh, yeah, we we'll definitely want to get to that, I mean, talk about a spiritual successor done right, uh, absolutely, can't wait to talk more about that. Well, um, well, clearly games with uh, Hero, Hero in the title were dangerous. Uh, I stayed up a lot of times till 3 or 4 in the morning playing uh, Heroes of Might and Magic and, uh, oh, uh, yes. and probably jeopardized the job I was working at at the time because of it. Now we play Heroes of the Storm. Ah. I have not played that one much, Nick. Is that one more on your department? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's from Blizzard. Uh, I, I call it like kind of the, the fan, you know, fiction of like the entire Blizzard universe. And it's just, just a lot of fun. Yeah. It's sort of a League of Legends type game. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm not our usual type, but you know, we can play anything. Oh, I envy that. I've tried League of Legends and I, I, I'd give Heroes of the Storm a shot, but I'm afraid it would have the same results. I'm not as fast as I used to be. <laughs> well, well. I, can tell you, I can tell you, I sucked at it for about six months. Lori started playing uh, earlier than I did, and I started playing with her, and I had no clue what was going on or what I was doing. And uh, and we didn't know that there was a uh, versus AI mode where you could play against computers, so we were playing in uh, quick matches against live players. And, oh, uh, no. I was just, just I was just ruining every team I was on. <laughs> 
Oh man, yeah, I I don't know. I find uh, I've kind of gone back to playing the games that I had grown up playing. Like I've started getting back into more adventure games and uh, RPGs. Like I was playing a lot of the Bard's Tale Four, uh, the latest oh. from In Exile. Loving that one. But, Good. Um, but yeah, actually, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please. Oh, I was just gonna say I have all these games like the uh, like Bard's Tale Four uh, that you know I supported on Kickstarter and that are sitting in my. Uh, my digital downloads directory waiting for me to get around to them but I, <laughs> oh, be... it's the same way same way with my shelf uh you know it used <laughs> to be filled with uh boxed uh, games such as the dragons and chivalry and sorcery and you know every other rune quest all those other game paper games that i never got around to so you big into board games pen uh, pen and paper stuff like that uh pen and paper stuff not so much i mean as teenagers we played board games uh but uh you know, we discovered Dungeons and Dragons and uh, uh, different variations on, and both got hooked in that. And, yeah, uh, did that a lot in their twenties, thirties, forties. Yeah, I mean, once you find uh, the concept, core concept of of uh, Dungeons and Dragons is everybody wins. Yeah, and so for that, was the right way to play a game. Oh yeah, definitely. So, all right, speaking of days past, uh, when did you guys first get into game design? Like, when did that become your thing? Or was that something you always wanted to do? Well, it's something we already always did, whether we wanted to or not, because we both <laughs> came from game-playing families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in a sense, uh, you know, I think we both started uh, making our own games at like 12 or something like that. And uh, for me, it was a matter of, uh, I went through, I had a book called Indoor Games and How to Play Them. And I just started going through it systematically and uh, learning every game there. One of them I remember was, uh, uh, I think it was called Shogi. It was Chinese chess. Uh, and uh, I made my own uh, pieces for it out of uh, uh, manila folders. They were three-dimensional pieces, so oh, wow. it's kind of fun. Uh, and stuff like that, but uh, yeah, once we got into D and D and uh, like our college years, uh, you know, we started uh, uh, you know playing with other players and then creating our own uh, scenarios and running them for our friends and uh, you know and uh, that kind of got us into the uh, storytelling mode of gaming. Awesome. Um, so, uh, so Sierra happened in we were like thirty by the time we got into Sierra. So we were not kids, uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, that was just a uh, coincidence because of, uh, well, Lori and I met at a science fiction convention over the gaming table, uh, where I was showing off my uh, paper module, Tower of Indomitable Circumstance, uh, and uh, we met some other science fiction fantasy fans there, and one of them was Carly Hawk's daughter. Whoop. Just make this short. Ah, she says, keep it short. Uh yeah, and uh, who's, who's no, that? Well, she's absolutely right. I, uh, the last time we did this, we spent an entire hour on the uh, intro and didn't get into anything else. <laughs> anyway, uh, Carly was a consultant for uh, uh, Sierra, and she uh, got us an introduction there. And uh, they said, "Hey, we need some you know experienced uh, dungeon masters that understand role playing games." And and I said, "Oh, by the way, my latest project was uh, as a programmer on the Atari ST." And they said, "Oh, really? They had a Atari ST project they needed someone for." Uh, so, just a whole lot of coincidence has got us into Sierra. That's what. What was it like working there? And you know, and what Nick and I, who are you know big fans of Sierra, and we grew up playing their games. It was kind of like that game you could always buy in the store if it had their logo on the box. What What was it like uh, working there? And what you know, many would say is their golden years. <laughs> uh, well, I like to refer to it as to a, a roller coaster. Uh -huh. uh, Lori has a, another three-word phrase for it. Yes, heaven <laughs> and hell. <laughs> it was the best of places. It was the worst of places. Uh -huh. We could never have gotten another job like this anywhere. So it was awesome. Wow. It was, just wasn't always fun to work there, but that's the story of any business. Sure, sure. Get your good days and your bad ones for sure. Yeah, I mean, we kind of had the, the wild west of the personal computer age and, uh, uh, you know, starting around 19, late 70s uh, and was still going on at the point we uh, came to Sierra at the end of the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the company was uh, very chaotically managed. Uh, and yet somehow, 
got a lot of enthusiastic people together, gave them some really good tools, and uh, we managed to make uh, some pretty cool games. But yeah. you know, I look at I look back on it now, and what we did was clearly impossible. We we couldn't actually have done it. It's it's amazing some of the stuff that came out of there. I mean, again, quest quest for glory. Just going back to that for a minute. Um, it really was, there, there was nothing like it at the time. I mean, you had, like, King's Quest and you had adventure games, but to my memory, it was really the first one that had combined that kind of tried-and-true Sierra adventure format with a role-playing game format and, the, you know, the ability to level your character and and at Well, the these time, are the things we loved in games. Right. So we loved the, the, the constant reinforcement of playing when the cake when your character keeps getting better and better. Yeah. And that's what made it exciting. But then Sierra had this wonderful adventure game st uh, style and engine to do it, so we really just needed to adapt that to what we really wanted to play in a game. Right. Yeah, so part of it is we, uh, you know, we started out with a unique system because we had done uh, our own paper uh, role-playing system uh, uh, for a few years before that, and that you know, it'd come out of something that Lori had picked up in Arizona also. Arizona D&D, &D, they called it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we did this thing called Fantasy Guild. But uh, so we had our own system to work with. Uh, and it really helped that I was a system programmer. And before we started on uh, Hero, uh, Heroes Quest, just the original title for Quest for right. Glory, uh, is that I did that Atari ST thing. Uh, and that means that I really understood what uh, Sierra's SCI language could and couldn't do. Mm -hmm. and what were the limitations of the system. So originally, Ken Williams just wanted an Ultima clone. And uh, <laughs> we said, sorry, with your tools, we can't give you that. Right. Uh, but what we can do is we can uh, give you something that feels like an adventure game, will appeal to your players, uh, but that has those role-playing things in. So uh, you know, I used to be a pretty good programmer. And I looked at it and said, okay, we can just overlay, you know, put a, a systems level on top of, uh, the SCI language that will do things like stats and skills and, uh, you know, in combat. Uh, and, uh, yeah, just kind of fit that in. And then the actual, you know, adventure game parts, we have immensely talented people working with us. So we had some really good artists and animators that could uh, bring things to life very quickly, and the tools were good for that. Uh, and then it was just a matter of, uh, you know, coming up with a story and setting and uh, some puzzles for it. Um Getting it all done in a year is the part that was impossible. I mean, we wow. we could have done that game in three years, but somehow we did it in one. Wow! So you talked about all, like all these different pieces. You know, obviously drawing from kind of your your D and D days of you know, and even like paper systems and and talking about you know even the story. Is there like any particular uh, kind of uh, mythos that was kind of your favorite? Obviously, Quest for Glory kind of spans you know kind of the global. You know, over the the entire series of game, kind of global mythos is is there like one that you know was really your favorite to work on or your favorite to pull from? You know, Greek mythology is what I'd say. What would you say, Lori? Yeah, well, yes, we were. I, you know, I had a strong fantasy and science fiction faction, and I also had a very strong on mythology, folklore, and things like that. And it. You're picking up a little. Hmm? Your voice is breaking up. That's interesting. So we wanted to bring this all together. Mm hmm Yeah, and, don't for, and uh, Lovecraft, too. Let's not forget that. Oh, yes. <laughs> just just uh, a little bit of that. But uh, <laughs> uh, we were obviously uh, uh, J.R. Tolkien fans and loved mm -hmm. The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Uh, uh, so we actually, uh, you know, we looked at most of the uh, fantasy, you know, kind of the high fantasy stories and so on. They were all kind of set in a... Uh, uh, a sort of a, a fantasy medieval Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. And and we said, well, that's kind of cliche at this point, but, uh, you know, since we might very well be only doing one game, let's give people what they expect. Right. And so that's why we set the original Heroes Quest in uh, Germany mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of went with a lot of those uh, tropes. But then uh, when Sierra approved a, a second game, we said, okay, let's, uh, you know, let's uh, break tradition now and move it down to the Arabian Nights because there's... Arabian Nights stories are, are really fascinating and they're not, you know, not been done a lot in uh, games. Uh, and we got to, you know, play with these stories within stories and Charizard and Genies and just all kinds of stuff. So, that was, you know, it was really fun to be able to, uh, you know, do some unusual settings and, 
you know, take advantage of all the things we've been reading for 30 years before that. Man, was that fun to play, too. I mean, as a gamer, that was really the first thing I had played that it even dove into that mythos. And, you know, I read that uh, the Thousand One Nights growing up and stuff like that. So to be able to actually live that in a game was, was just so great uh, for the time. Not to mention, probably one of my favorite features, and it, it's why, like... You know, you hear about, like, fans of Lord of the Rings that'll, you know, read the series once a year, every year, or something like that. And I'm kind of a weirdo in that I, I will play this series, like, the Quest for Glory series, once, you know, once a year, or a year and a half or so. Because you can transfer your character from game to game and, you know, bring them through. <clears throat> and to me, I remember the first time I, I realized you could do that, I had never seen that before. And that just gave such a new attachment to the series, and uh, so I, I guess my last question on the Quest for Glory front is, was that a planned feature from the start? Because, I mean, it oh, wasn't oh, the game, but... Absolutely, but it, was, but it was not completely original, giving credit where it's due. Uh, the Wizardry series uh, yeah. uh, did that. Yeah. Uh, and that's where we loved it from. But then they had to screw it up, because they would take your... Uh, which game was it? Th number three? Uh, yeah, three, they went back to the beginning. Yeah, they... they <laughs> said, okay, you can import your characters. Unfortunately, you're going to start all over again. <laughs> yeah, they kind of had to do that because uh, basically they had such a progression in power level, even in the first game where you went from level one spells up to level nine by the end of the game that uh, you know, you're doing the equivalent of the uh, Dungeons and Dragons meteor shower and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, tilt to weight was the uh, spell in wizardry that was the uh, you know super powerful uh, nuclear strike spell and <laughs> Uh, it's kind of hard to make a sequel when you're at that power level. Uh, so we planned from the beginning that we were going to have a gradual increase in power. Uh, we gave you a modest number of spells uh, in, in the first game. We uh, we kind of tricked people by uh, setting the uh, your character had uh, stats that range from 0 to 100. And that sounds like percentile, so you think 100 is the ultimate. Uh, but we knew all along that we were going to raise the number to 200 in the second game and up to 500 in the fifth game if we got that far. Um, we actually planned four originally, but we added one in. Um, right. Yeah, so, I remember what was the so ending yeah, of yeah, two. Yeah, we definitely we wanted to have that progression where you would be able to take the same character through and have that heroic experience of uh, uh, becoming powerful as you went along. Yes, yeah, part of our main design uh, premise was that we wanted you to be immersed in these games that you felt like you were living them, not just trying to solve a problem or hit your head against a, an impossible puzzle. Yeah. And, and that's, again, that's what it felt like, you know, you, but, and I remember, you know, by the end of that series, you really feel like a Herculean badass. <laughs> like it's, it, it was just a masterstroke. It's why I still play it to this day. Um, and so, it, it, so by the, by the way, the whole thing about you know heaven and hell at Sierra, uh, uh, <laughs> the thing that a lot of people don't realize because they love games and you know games are fun to play and challenging and so on. Uh, what they don't realize is it is hell making them. Uh, it is just it is enormous amount of work. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, sixty hour sixty hour weeks were just the norm in the gaming industry, uh, and uh, you know people work six or seven days a week, and uh, uh, you were constantly fighting deadline pressure. And particularly when we started, it was just the assumption that all, all Sierra games were going to be done in uh, uh, under a year. Wow. Uh, and that is just, you know, going from start to finish, design, to, you know, premise to design to uh, development to uh, uh, testing. And what we discovered by about the third game, because uh, uh, Sierra kept changing the rules on us, too. Oh. Uh, but as the technology became more advanced, uh, the art started taking you know, five times as long to do uh, VGA art as compared to ETA art. Sure. And everything became more difficult and more complex. Uh, and uh, that means the game needed a lot more testing time. And Sarah wasn't, you know, really set up for that. So, uh, you know, someone in the second game, actually the second game had a, uh, a major bug where you could uh, become a paladin in the game. Uh, oh. And the problem is that about two weeks before release, in fact, the game was about to be released, uh, I finally played that through and discovered that there was a little programming bug that uh, you went into an infinite loop, and uh, uh, if you uh, qualified for Paladin, you would you went back to the beginning of the game and just started over again. Oh, no. Uh, 
Uh, so you cannot actually finish the game. So we've had problems like that with most of our games. And uh, it really required, uh, and I'll get into that when we talk about Hero U, but Hero U, we put through 10 months of testing. Oh, and wow. Think about that on a one-year schedule. <laughs> yeah, I. that's hard to imagine. I mean, one of our co-hosts, uh, Travis, used to be a game developer, and he's very sensitive to, to issues like that because, you know, he he's worked in the industry and, and you know, the crunch and all that. So, it, yeah, hearing his stories and now hearing what you guys did in a year is kind of mind-blowing. Like, I can understand the hell aspect of it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, things are simpler. You know, we started out, we had 16-color, low-resolution graphics, mm -hmm. uh, and that meant the art was relatively fast because there wasn't much they could do. Right. Uh, but they still managed to make those characters uh, <clears throat> look and feel alive, and they were pretty cool stuff. Totally. So they really did a good job even with that. But uh, as we started to go for a more realistic look and better graphics, and then we started get, adding voice acting, uh, orchestral music and stuff like that. And John uh, Rhys-Davies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, John Rhys-Davies was amazing to work with on Quest for Glory 4. Uh, wonderful guy and uh, incredibly talented. And yes. all, the, all the actors were, were great to work with. And in point of fact, like you probably had to be a little bit more meticulous going into a launch. You know, not to say that you know, obviously you're, you're, you're saying like you know, spent ten months on you know just bug fixing for here or you, but like back then you really had to be meticulous because once it was out, there was no way to necessarily patch or potentially like release a fix uh, outside of like maybe releasing like a game potentially or a, a disc through like a mail order or something like that. Correct? Yeah, unfortunately, had to and did or uh, didn't always match. Yes. <laughs> uh, quest for glory quest for glory was uh you know today many players think quest for glory was the pinnacle of the series and uh our uh, uh, best game uh but at the time it uh, it was barely playable it crashed you uh, you started out in a, a a cave you got out of the cavern complex and out into the world and in the next scene the game crashed i had that version on flop on the floppy disks i remember that yep yep and uh Fortunately, uh, right about then, uh, and you know, basically, uh, we argued the game wasn't really ready to release. But the programmers, you know, after working their uh, you know eighty-hour weeks at the end of uh, the crunch, uh, were so burned out they didn't even want to see the game anymore. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, you know, everybody knew there was a problem with it, and right about that point, uh, and we did not have voice acting originally. Yep. Uh, so right at that point, uh, I think it was King's Quest. Five or six, I guess it was King's Quest Six was out uh, and was you know voice acted, and so uh, we actually I, I don't know how this happened, but somehow management at Sierra authorized us to uh, to add uh, to go to CD-ROM and do a, a voice acted version of the game, mm -hmm. uh, and we had another year to do that, uh, and so we had one programmer that worked for you know about six months just fixing bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the meantime, we got in all the uh, uh, the uh, voice acting, and so we ended up with not only a game that sounds beautiful, uh, but actually had you know was playable. Still yeah. had a lot of bugs, but it was playable. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Now there was a big, big difference in the CD version. I, I remember that clearly, and uh, it's awesome that you got that chance because that is a, a fantastic game, and you know it's one when you play it today, you know you usually get the CD version, you wouldn't know it, but. Uh, you know, the problems that it had. But yeah, it was really, really good. But, um, all right, so I, I'd like to fast forward to the present now and talk about Transolar Games. Uh, when did you guys uh, get together and start, you know, Transolar Games as a company, for those who may not have heard of it? Well, technically, Transolar Games started in 1999. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we left Sierra in 98, uh, and uh, we we were talking with Sierra about, uh, or we released the last game at the end of 98, and uh, beginning of 99, Lori was actually still uh, uh, consulting with them, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we talked with Sierra about doing uh, an expansion pack for Quest for Glory 5 that would uh, have to do with uh, going out into the uh, Mediterranean and fighting pirates, and uh, would be kind of a whole uh, Odyssey and Iliad type experience. Uh, yeah, I remember hearing that. Uh, and maybe even have multiplayer. Uh, I remember the and, multiplayer being talked about. I do remember that. Yeah, that Quest for Glory 5 was originally designed to be a multiplayer game, uh, and uh, it just basically 
you know, even though it took longer than the previous games, it's like three and a half year development effort in that one. Uh, it, it wasn't enough time to to get all those features in and test right. it, and you would have had to uh, you know get it networked and get uh, outside testers and stuff like that. And Sierra just wasn't set up for that. Uh, but uh, anyway, so we formed Transolar Games. Uh, uh, name came from uh, uh, my old boss at Sierra, Bob Heitman, and he was going to work with us on it. And uh, we were going to uh, uh, work as an outside uh, company, but uh, develop uh, uh, you know. Uh, expansions to Quest for Glory for Sierra. Uh, okay. And then they had the uh, big uh, uh, shutdown where they, uh, you know, they, uh, they called it Chainsaw Monday, oh, where they basically entirely closed down uh, most of Sierra, including our entire division. Uh, and that went out the door. But uh, Trade Solar sort of floated around uh, for several years. And uh, uh, meanwhile, I went to work. Uh, Lori and I were doing a... Um, a massively multiplayer world called uh, Explorati. Uh, that uh, uh, that one died to uh, on 9/11, 2001. Uh, somebody flew a plane into the World Trade Center, oh. uh, and uh, we were developing our game under contract to uh, Procter and Gamble, which uh, had its headquarters in the World Trade Center. Oh. and so that was the end of Explorati. Wow. Uh, uh, admittedly, we had so many problems going on with the company. We had about a you know a couple you know million dollars or so, which uh, sounds like a lot of money, but was about one tenth of what we needed to develop what we were doing. Oh yeah, you know? no, in, in <laughs> for an MMO, that's that's not enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, somebody asked the question the other day: How to make a million dollars creating an MMO? And uh, gave the uh, stock answer we learned at Explorati, which is to start with ten million, uh, take nine million of it, and uh, uh, use it as a uh, uh, starter for a bonfire, uh, <laughs> and and then you walk away with the other million because if you actually put it into the MMO, you won't even have that left. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, MMOs cost a fortune. Actually, modern AAA games cost you know hundred million dollars to make oh, these it's days. Crazy. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's uh, crazy. Sierra, Sierra, all the games we did at Sierra up until Quest for Glory Five were under a million. Oh wow, that's uh, interesting. So. Uh, Anyway, so where were we? Oh, Explorati. So we went from there to, uh, uh, I went to work doing uh, online poker and similar games uh, for a company called Jet Set Poker. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Lori, meanwhile, uh, was working with a fan writing a, a book, uh, kind of loosely based on the Quest for Glory mm -hmm. story called uh, How to Be a Hero. And they developed a website. It was the How to Be a Hero website, uh, which we eventually morphed into the School for Heroes, where I remember uh, that. Lori, Lori, Lori role-played all the professors. Oh, and really? taught people how to be heroes in real life. Oh, wow. I, I do remember signing up for that. I was in college at the time. Oh, awesome! Yeah, oh, I, again, I'm a freak when it came to Quest for Glory, and I, I, I remember uh, following you guys kind of, you know, online once um, you had left Sierra, because I figured, I'm like, you know, <laughs> this series can't die! Something has to continue! <laughs> And uh, <laughs> so but when the I saw this, actually died after Quest for Glory Four. Sierra canceled. They, they just uh, we had a three game contract with. Uh, right. So they just said, "Okay, bye." Uh, oh, wow. And uh, uh, and they got about uh, uh, I think over ten thousand uh, uh, by paper mail uh, letters from fans saying, "You got to do, got to do Quest for Glory you Five. Finish this off." Finish. <laughs> and uh, and to their credit, they did. And we made Quest for Glory 5. But uh, then the whole company went away. Uh, There's a big accounting scandal and so on. There wasn't actually anything to do with Sierra, but they got caught up in it. Ah, oh, bummer. Uh, so, so anyway, the School for Heroes uh, was always intended to uh, support the books. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about making a game uh, that would uh, go with the School for Heroes. But we had no idea. We didn't have a publisher or anything. So how do you fund it? How do you make it? Uh, and then Kickstarter came along in uh, 2012 and... Tim Schaefer and uh, Double Fine uh, came out with the Double Fine Adventure, which became Broken Age. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we started getting phone calls and emails from uh, fans saying, hey, look at this thing. Uh, see what uh, <laughs> Tim's doing, and uh, you got to make a new game. And we said, oh, okay. We'd be insane, too, but we will. <laughs> well, glad you did. I mean, you really hit the nail on the head. I think Kickstarter has really revolutionized you know, game development in this sense that it really does 
give fans a bit of a voice to say, you know, hey, like, th- this is what we want to see. And when someone comes out to propose something like that, you know, these ideas just skyrocket. And I remember when you guys did the Kickstarter for Hero U. I mean, I, I, I was well out of college at that point. I remember contributing to the Kickstarter because it was like, we, you know, that it gave me a, a chance to say, yeah, that's a game I want to see. And, you know, no AAA publisher is going to go after something like this because they all want to just repeat the formula that's making money. And so it's like, you know, I saw that and I'm like, oh my God, there's a chance we're going to have some kind of, you know, Quest for Glory inspired game. And, and Kickstarter allowed for that. I think it's, it's amazing. Like, I'm just, I guess what I'm getting, I'm just so glad Kickstarter happened and exists. I agree. We would never be able to make this game anywhere else. It allowed us to have complete creative freedom. Mm-hmm. It limited only by how much money we had. <laughs> uh, there's a, a Wynn Goldman, a screenwriter, wrote uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and Princess mm-hmm. Bride and some other films. Uh, and we have a couple of uh, books by him on screenwriting. And one of the things he says, uh, um, uh, well, one of his books is called What Why Did I Tell? Uh, but uh, his basic thing in Hollywood is nobody knows what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, obviously included himself in that. And that is certainly true in the game industry. So when you talk about the, uh, uh, you know, the publishers want to uh, do more of the thing that works, they don't actually know what works. Yeah. You know, they're all, uh, they're, all, they're all chasing after something where they, they have no idea what they do. Most of the uh, people running the companies are not gamers. Right. Uh, and it's not clear that many gamers really know what they want either. So, uh, yeah. Uh, That's a fair point. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, it's can I, can I say that we, we're any better? Well, obviously, uh, when it comes to uh, scheduling and getting a game done and stuff out time, obviously, I don't know what I'm doing because uh, <laughs> you know, we thought this game would take one to two years and it took six. Yeah. Uh, Plus, we didn't go into the Kickstarter initially thinking we were going to make a, another massively huge Quest for Glory style game. Mm-hmm. We were actually very limited focus. We were going to do just this top-down little roguelike adventure game with some storytelling to it until we <laughs> found what Kickstarter really was, was a, a bunch, bunch of fans, fans who really wanted something different. Yeah, uh, Tim Schafer with the Double Fine Adventure uh, actually proposed that he was going to show people how adventure games are made. Uh-huh. And so he was going to make a little mini game, a little prototype of a game. Uh, he got uh, uh, his ask was, uh, I think, $400,000, uh, which is what we asked for also. Uh, and of that $400,000, $100,000 was going to go to a, a film company, uh, a two-player game, a production, two-player productions, that was mm-hmm. going to film the process of them making this little uh, thing. And he... He visualized it as they'd use something like uh, Adventure Game Studio or something and make a little three or four room game uh, just to show what a game was. Well, right. uh, the fans came through and the next thing he knew, he had 80,000 backers and <laughs> $3.3 million instead of uh, three or 400,000 uh, and discovered that he had actually promised to make a real game. Uh, and in fact, uh, they discovered that they couldn't make that for $3 million. Uh, the game actually, uh, I actually talked to uh, uh, the former uh, chief financial officer, and uh, he estimated the budget is about $8 million by the time it was done. Oh, wow. Uh, so uh, Broken Age was a very expensive production. Uh, but uh, we naively came in, and we saw, okay, hey, uh, Tim Schafer came in, and, you know, he's, uh, he's a guy who's known for games in the 90s, just like us, and he asked for 400000 and people came through with $3 million, and... Ah, we'll do that too. We we didn't know about all the preparation steps and stuff that he did to make that possible. So we came in and asked for four hundred thousand. It became very clear from the beginning. We got a hundred thousand very quickly. But Kickstarter is all or nothing. You get four hundred thousand, yeah. you get zero. Uh, and uh, we finally got we hit the four hundred thousand mark about I don't know half an hour, maybe two hours uh, before the end of the campaign. After forty days of uh, working our tails off mm-hmm. on it. Uh, so, uh, it, we discovered it was not so easy to turn 400,000 into 3 million, uh, and, and it's tough. And, uh, yeah. our game also, we, you know, by that time in order to get there, to get from, uh, you know, not quite making the goal and failing up to barely making the goal, 
uh, we promised people what we really wanted to make in the first place, which was a full uh, Quest for Glory st- uh, st- you know, style game with uh, you know characters walking around, animation and role mm-hmm. playing and combat and stats and all the other cool stuff that uh, you know we had uh, pioneered in the uh, '90s or you know late '80s to '90s. Mm-hmm. So, so we had a huge project, but the original idea was to make a roguelike uh, uh, game with a top-down uh, you know chess board like graphics and would have been a much simpler game right well i mean might have even come in at budget (laughs) yeah so people you know uh uh, you know have chewed me out and said well you know you're you know you obviously don't know how to manage a game company well uh you know you would have had a good estimate in the first place well what i estimated for was the project we thought we were going to make right and what the people on the kickstarter said is that's not the game we want to see uh, right. And so, by the time we did that, I basically promised them a new quest for glory. And the last quest for glory cost us, uh, you know, three, uh, cost Sierra uh, something like I can't remember if it was three and a half or four and a half million dollars uh, in uh, nineteen ninety eight dollars, nineteen ninety five dollars. Right. Uh, so uh, that would be uh, uh, you know about uh, six million dollars today. Yeah. So I promised a six million dollar game, and we had four hundred thousand dollars to make it with. <laughs> uh, so something was going to give. What gave was the time schedule. So, right. you know, if you have infinite money, you can hire uh, infinite monkeys to uh, uh, you know, <laughs> right type to the keyboard, and pretty soon you have t- Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, I think uh, that's how it works, isn't it? Uh, so with uh, very, very limited money, uh, you know, uh, first thing to go was, uh, uh, you know, we were this was where we were going to make a living, and instead first thing to go was we didn't pay ourselves anything. Right. And second thing to go is that uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, part-time people uh, putting in, you know, 10 hours a week rather than 50. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, that kind of stretches out a game schedule. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. So, so, uh, so it's been a, you know, it was exciting and chaotic uh, and fun, but uh, really, really hard. And hard we knew now. it would be really hard because we remembered how rough it was at Sierra. Mm-hmm. But yeah, sort of, you know, remembering and and actually being there doing it are two different things. Sure. Uh, we also uh, got, we're like 25 years older uh, by the time we started this one, so uh, uh, that kind of makes a difference, too. Not yeah. Spring chickens. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the thing with Sierra was every game we made, it was starting over round one. Yes, we had a story going, but our system always changed out from under us, and we were played by different rules of how to deal with people and how to get the team together and things like that every time we made a game. Wow. And uh, it, that kind of experience meant we were good at improvising, which is what we needed to do for making Hero You. Yeah. We had to... We, had to get a team together, we had to find people all around the world to work on the game, and we had to be flexible enough to make use of them all. Right. And we didn't have a nice, uh, you know, marketing department like Sierra had that would, uh, you know, create an interaction magazine and uh, uh, took care of press releases and all that stuff. So sure. uh, in between working the game, I had to do that, and then I was the bookkeeper and stuff, and uh, I actually went through this once before. I did the uh, game Shannara for, uh, or Shannara for Legend Entertainment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we used Legend's tools, so we had the big head start on tools. Uh, but we had our own office in Oakhurst, uh, uh, and I hired all the people for that. And uh, then I did all the uh, bookkeeping and the, the budgets and uh, managing people and so on. Uh, you know, you do all that, you find you don't actually have any time to actually design the game. Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, what's pretty much been the uh, the story of my gaming life is uh, uh, Lori ends up writing 90% of the stuff. <laughs> and, you know, I contribute ideas and so on, but I don't have the time for the day-to-day writing. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, how many things can you do at once? Right, yeah, you only have so much time. Uh, but, I mean, it's it's obvious that the two of you make a really awesome creative team, and, you know, it, it definitely shows in the work. Um. And uh, speaking a, a bit more about Hero U, um, so it's, you know, it, I, I'll, I'll admit I'm on day 30 right now, and I've kind of been savoring this game. I'm not trying to rush through it, and I'm trying to get all the quests done that I can. And, I, again, really, really enjoying it, but, 
you know, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is there is, aside from the many, many amazing uh, Quest for Glory style puns and humor, which I love, um, it, it, there's a lot of hints and implications that this game takes place in, I, I've never known if this is the official name, but Gloriana, the, the same world of Quest for Glory. Now, is it... Is this just like nostalgia Easter eggs, or, or or is Hero U like actually a place in that world? Well, Gloriana actually is uh, Lori's and my uh, uh, tabletop gaming world. Okay. So, uh, uh, and we actually had two of them. We had two parallel worlds, Gloriana and Corian. Uh, Corian was after our names, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, Gloriana was kind of our serious uh, tabletop uh, role playing world. Uh, and obviously, when we went to Sierra, we uh, we pulled from that uh, as the background for the Quest for Glory world. Uh, and you know, it's uh, it's kind of the thing we've been developing over uh, you know thirty years or more. So obviously, we use the pretty much the same world for uh, uh, for Hero U. Um, but uh, you know, I need to make clear that it is Gloriana and not Quest for Glory. Right. Uh, yeah. But Quest for Glory was kind of set in that world too. So, sure. therefore, our, the histories are the same, and this takes place about 20 years after the last of the Quest for Glory series. Okay. Yeah, because... And I, that does, it does play a part in it. All right. Yeah, as I was say, because you see statues of Rakesh, a statue of Irana, um, you know, so it's, it was one of those, like, man... I, I, it's, to me, I you know, just being a greedy fan, I just see potential, <laughs> lots and lots of potential. <laughs> um, yeah, well, they want you... the fans to feel like they came home, and, and that's exactly what this feels like. And it's why, like, you know, typically if I'm gonna, you know, do an interview or play a game and and review it or something, I you know, I, I rush through to the end to say you know I beat it, but I'm like I can't, I can't do that with this. Like I just want to soak up this this whole thing. It's like coming home after, you know, twenty years, and it's just. Uh, it's a wonderful experience to do that. And I think one of my favorite things about this that, you know, the previous quest style games didn't really have, you know, cause you probably couldn't do it, but with the system, but with hero, you, there's a huge focus on friendships and relationships with other characters that you're going to the school with. And the, every one of them is just unique. They're their own person. And it's, it's one of my favorite things while playing the game, you know, Katie's very distinctive as a, you know, daughter of a pirate, and, you know, you have Joel, who's kind of this mysterious, standoffish, uh, uh, cowering to Sosi, but is he really, like, you know, everyone's got their own, their own feel, their own agenda, and so I, I guess, like, the first thing I wanted to ask is, do you have a favorite out of all of them, you know, I, either one of you, is there one that stands out as one of your favorite characters there? Well, I had to think about that question, but my answer is Sean O'Connor, main Absolutely. character. <laughs> you know, you, first of all, you really have to like a character in person when you're going to be writing about it. You have to care about him and know him inside out. Mm -hmm. and, and in effect, Sean is three different characters. He's a snarky, cynical, <laughs> uh, snide character that might be very, you know, snarky the entire game. On the same hand, he could be the sweetest, nicest person you've ever met who really wants to help everybody and make friends in that. Or he could be, you know, some combination. Or he could just be a smart ass. You know? <laughs> and, and so when you're writing this game, Well, she means a smart T, because he can go the uh, intelligent route and the diligent student and working hard at the skills yeah. and so on. So that's, you know, he's really got all of those aspects in him. Uh, and the player kind of decides which one to emphasize. So yeah, the player can say, I want to do the smart thing or I want to do the, uh, you know, the uh, snarky thing. He's, a, he's, thing. he's a clever so, smarty for me. He, clever smarty. Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's so much fun. And you're writing that in a script. You have to really keep that concept of, he could be either of three characters at the same time. Yep. So it's a really challenging, but it's a lot of fun. Lori never does anything the easy way. Uh, so Lori <laughs> wrote, you know, almost all the character dialogue and stuff. So she saw the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, the other stuff, all the things you mentioned, the the puns and the 
uh, the humorous objects and so on. Almost all that was uh, actually, uh, you said it was a you know, Quest for Glory style, but it's actually uh, written by Josh Mandel, uh, okay. who, uh, who wrote most of uh, uh, Freddy Farkas' Frontier Pharmacist, along with Al Lowe. Oh, I love that uh, game. Yeah. And, uh, and he wrote a lot of our incidental messages for Shannara, too. Uh, oh, so, wow. uh, Josh is a hilarious guy. He used to be a stand-up comedian before he got into game development. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's really, he wrote all the stuff that I would have been writing if I were working full-time and writing instead of, uh, trying to run a company. Mm-hmm. It, really funny. It's, it's another, one of my favorite components of, of Hero U is just, it, it just, it kind of slaps you. Like, you're not expecting a certain moment to be funny and then you're just, you're cracking up. Like, it's just simple hilarious puns it's i don't know i love it and and i can tell you that everything you love uh we always we always get a few haters uh so we've had people we have people that are just blown away and love the uh, artwork which includes us by the way oh yeah uh, and, and the music we think is absolutely incredible and then we've gotten uh you know in the characters you mentioned uh, you said every character is unique well we've had uh, people say well every character here is a cliche and they're they're uh uh, there's no difference between them, and we're like, "What game are you playing?" Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, and we've had people complain about the artwork, and we've had people complain about the music, as oh, you know, it. bland. And it's like, what? You know, we have an award-winning, you know, uh, composer Ryan Grogan who has made us an awesome uh, orchestral score that holds up against Lord of the Rings or anything else. And <laughs> I, I love and the it's theme just like, song. Okay, you get hate everywhere. Like the theme song is is fantastic. All the music in it's great. I'd love to get a soundtrack actually, but yeah, it's really really good. I I I mean I have no complaints. I'm enjoying the hell out of the game. And yeah, uh, this is the first game that we've created that I can honestly say I am so proud of. Oh, it all awesome. came together. I mean, you know, when you've had the game like I my favorite would be Quest for Glory Four, but the bugs all destroyed it. It was so devastating when I made that and found out they released it after one week of testing. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, so as much as I love the story and the characters, I really, that just, like, oh. But Euro U, Rogue to Redemption, really is, it turned out, it's about as good as we could ever do. I, it, so... So we put uh, Who Are You into testing uh, when it wasn't actually quite finished. Uh, there was a lot of work to be done in combat still, and I think we had about three quarters of the rest of the game, two thirds to three quarters. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, over the period of about uh, uh, six to eight months, we had people playing that, and meanwhile we delivered the rest of the content. Uh, but you know, a few areas it took a lot, a lot of back and forth, but uh, eventually got it done. And then once we had everything done, we put into two more months of beta testing. Uh, mm. And believe me, we needed every uh, every week of that. Uh, it's just uh, there's just so much. This game is so much. You know, it's bigger than any of the Quest for Glories as far as uh, amount of dialogue and oh my God, complexity of switching. It, it's huge. I've spent the past I want to say three weeks, like putting in a few hours a night. You know, playing the game, and of course, I'm a bit of a a save scummer. You know, going back and checking things, but um. It's... Yeah, one of the uh, one of the decisions we made is that uh, we wanted conversation to feel natural, yeah. and so we did not do the uh, the Monkey Island style thing where you could basically uh, uh, go through every line of dialogue and every conversation, uh, and instead you have to make choices. Yep. And you choose uh, what attitude you're going to take and what you're going to say, uh, and the conversation then proceeds from there. So it is you know without save scumming, it is literally impossible to uh, to see the entire game in one uh, one playthrough. And I, I, as I it is, that. it takes about 25 hours, uh, we've been told, on average, to play through the game. I, I wouldn't know. I haven't finished it. <laughs> and then there's the difference between a Sierra game or a Monkey Island game and the rooms of this game. You know, a given room, quote-unquote, can take place across several screens, you know. Mm -hmm. Like the sea cave has about, oh, I think it's... 20 rooms, mm -hmm. but those 20 rooms are like four screens each, so you oh, yeah, just have huge. this massive feel to the game. So, uh, yeah, Sierra game was, uh, each screen was a still background screen. There was a, 
uh, originally 320 by 200, and then uh, by by three we're up to 640 by 400, and mm-hmm. got all the way up to 256 colors. So this is true color, 24 bit, uh, and uh, all the scenes are 3D. And when you're going down a hallway, you know you can go down the hallway for a couple minutes. Uh, yep. And it's you know so that really in the Sierra sense where we had typically 50 to 60 rooms in a Sierra game, uh, we have the equivalent of hundreds of this one. Yeah, the, uh, the game's huge. Um, and, you know, so we definitely wanted to make it feel like you're really going through this castle and these sea caves and so on, really feel like a real <laughs> environment to explore uh, rather than something you just pop room to room. And the big difference between Quest for Glory and Hero U was that Quest for Glory, you were that character. Mm-hmm. You were that main character, and it was your decisions. We didn't put words in your character's mouth. We just let you use your own imagination and pretend that's your avatar in the world. Mm-hmm. But with Hero You, we were taking the opposite approach, the one where you're playing a different character, a real character with personality and a backstory you don't know that you have to figure out. And yeah. the character is very much a part of the world and you get to learn more about the character as the character learns about it uh and it's a different experience and so we weren't at all sure making this game whether this would be even appeal to the people who love the avatar system you know yeah so it's a you know kind of a throwback in a way because uh most of the other games when we were doing quest for glory were using the uh, single viewpoint character Yep. You had uh, Ripsella in King's Quest IV. You had Guybrush Threepwood in uh, Monkey Island. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we decided that, well, we admitted that they were kind of right. <laughs> when uh, Ron Gilbert uh, and, uh, uh, you know, put Guybrush into uh, a Secret of Monkey Island, uh, by having a viewpoint character, you can give him a style and an attitude and... Uh, uh, you know, and actually craft lines instead of uh, having to apply them, which we did with uh, the hero in uh, Quest for Glory. So yeah, you, gain it, some, you gain something in storytelling, you lose a little in immersion, maybe. Yeah, it took me a little bit to get used to, because, you know, obviously I, I, I had read up, you know, and followed the game as it went through the Kickstarter, and I, I checked on it in and out of development and stuff. And I remember when, you know, initially, you know, you guys revealed Sean O'Connor as the, as the main character, I was like, oh, wow, you know, um, that's different. And then when I started playing it, you know, at first I was like, oh, okay, so it's it's not, you know, it's not what I was expecting. And then I, I remember even sitting there and saying, okay, look, to myself, like, let, you know, <laughs> stop stop your expectations. Let's just play the game, you know, as it is. And, and I, I'm glad I did that because, I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, there might have been other fans like me expecting just to have another Quest for Glory. And I'm really glad that Hero U is not just that. Like, there's... There's so much, I hate to, to say character, but there's so much character to Sean and to the people around him that it really makes the game, I, I think, better in a way um, because you, you do get attached much more to this main character uh, than, a, than even a character I was pretending to be, you know, in the Quest series. It just, um, I don't know, it, it just, to me, it made for a better game. And, you know... It, it's like, you know, you were saying, Lori, where he's, you know, he could be charming, he could be snarky, he's just, it, I'm loving, you know, each day, you know, learning more about his character and, and about his, uh, you know, where he comes from. It's, it's, it's just made the game all the more, all the more interesting. And um, I, I guess, so, uh, one thing I, I definitely want to ask is, I, I, I see we're, we're getting close to an hour into this, and I don't necessarily want to keep you guys all night, but, um... <laughs> Uh, oh, well, we do it. We do, we did a, uh, we do, we've done two uh, live streams, uh, one of which was 12 hours of a live stream. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> we could keep you up all night. Uh, but, uh, yeah, what, the one thing one of the reviewers uh, uh, said about uh, Quest for Glory and Hero U uh, that I really hadn't thought of, but he said uh, what differentiated our games from the other adventure games and other games was playing is uh, charm or heart. Yes. Uh, and, you know, he really pegged it, is that, uh, uh, you know, if you play, like, Call of Duty, uh, you know, you have an intense game experience, and you're, you know, going out there, and, you know, you're immersed in the environment, you're just 
you know, this adrenaline soap thing of trying to stay alive and find your targets and get them. Uh, Hero You is a, uh, you know, it's exciting, but it's a slow kind of excitement. It's mm-hmm. one where you're really immersed in. It's a game of, uh, you know, of heart, of caring about the other characters, caring about your character, Sean, uh, and, you know, having this person who is, you know, a poor person uh, growing up and is now uh, trying to learn to be a hero uh, and, you know, trying to identify with that character and, and just, uh, you know, relate to people. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's it's a different type of game experience than most of what's out there. It, for sure. And again, I, I think the immersion factor is is a big one for this because I didn't realize it was 3 a.m. Uh, yesterday. <laughs> well, today, I should say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's... Uh, I'm again. I'm really, really enjoying this game, and I have to ask two things. Uh, one, uh, what is up with that creepy portrait in the library? <laughs> you'll well, out. you'll find out. And... Uh, there is uh, there is someone in the game that you've certainly met by now, being a day uh, thirty, uh, someone or something, uh, who will give you more information about that when okay. the time comes. Uh, at the moment, just know that it is a magical portrait. Uh, and it has an aura about it to uh that is not really harmful but uh discourages people from approaching it. Yeah, uh, I broke into and, the library and found that out. I did that at night. Yeah. And there uh, <laughs> and there is a reason for that. Uh, and uh uh eventually you will need to solve the mystery of that uh, portrait in order to proceed with the game. Okay. Yeah. When the time comes. Good to this know. game is a lot like, you know, a tip up of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of story in this game that is underneath. I mean, yep. all, it's all got all the history that was in Quest for Glory and our D&D games of years ago. But that's just a layer. Now we have the layer of this game, but there's other things coming on and happening that are going to affect the games in the future. Oh, And, yeah. and the other thing in this, uh, the history goes beyond us. So you mentioned the... Uh, you know, the uh, cute little references to Quest for Glory, like Irana and so on. Well, obviously, we were very, very careful not to uh, violate the, uh, you know, the copyrights and trademarks on, uh, you know, a game that uh, that we designed, but we did as a work for hire. So it belongs right. to Activision. Uh, but uh, we also, we allowed an enormous amount of freedom to our uh, fans and backers who supported the game. And, uh, you know, several of them wanted to have uh, you know, characters in the game that they remembered from, you know, or, the, yeah. or lines about Quest for Glory and so on. And we said, okay, well, it comes from a backer, so it's fine. Uh, and <laughs> our team artists uh, also uh, created, uh, like, uh, it was Rakisha or Arana. I can't remember. One of those oh, statues uh, was... Uh, Arana. Arana. Okay, it was put in by J.P. Selwood, uh, our uh, lead artist. Okay. Uh, because he really liked Arana. And so oh, said, who doesn't? Who the heck and, doesn't? And Rakisha also, Lori yeah. says... Uh, so he was putting in references because he loved the uh, Quest for Glory games too. Uh, uh, but it goes well beyond that because, uh, you know, all the portraits in the walls and so on were all supplied by backers. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, you know, we had to, we were careful with that because we didn't want to run into, uh, I read a review of the uh, Leisure Suit Larry Reloaded and they said, well, the, uh, entire game was, you know, a, a, a pan to the, the backers. Right. Uh, but, uh, what we did is we we knew we wanted all those portraits and statues around the uh, hallways, and rather than invent them all, we allowed the backers to invent them. Uh, but we then had Josh go in and write the text for them, so that uh, you know, along with what the backers, uh, you know, suggested for text, so everything fits into the game environment. Oh, yeah. and feels like it belongs in that uh, that old castle. Okay, it does. Like so, I had wondered, I had wondered if maybe that was a Kickstarter thing, but it was never obvious where I could say, "Oh yeah, it was." So you just kind of confirmed. I was like, "I wonder if." Yeah, yeah. yeah. and there are some a... really crazy ones. But what we did was, in a lot of cases, the backer influenced stories become part of the world. Yeah. So a yeah. lot of those people have actually, you know, they're, they're part of the world. They're going to affect the game in future. Um, just because we wanted an integrated, you know, we want to feel like this is a real world that you're visiting. Yeah, so there's a uh, statue of a sea serpent in one room and uh, a couple of kids interacting with it. And uh-huh. Lori turned that into part of the storyline. So, uh, the, you know, the backward suggested this and Lori said, okay, that'd be an interesting thing. So she actually, uh, elsewhere in the game, there is a sea serpent that you interact with. I love uh, the sea and- serpent. 
<laughs> cool. And the history of that sea serpent relates to the storyline that that statue suggests. Huh. Um, and uh, and that would not have been in the game, except it was uh, something that, you know, a backer came up with the idea, and uh, uh, Lori figured out how to make that part of the world. Uh, but I was going to say, we're back to the creepy portrait in the library. The creepy portrait in the library, uh, whose uh, nickname is Creepy Guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm just going to say, uh, was actually came out of a Quest for Glory fan site. And a group of fans there did uh, online role playing there and had their own characters and so on. Uh, and that character who's in the portrait is one of those characters. Oh, that's and, awesome. Uh, uh, and that was a major backer who, uh, you know, helped us uh, actually wrote uh, the original design for part of the game for us. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, that goes really into the history of the world and so on, comes out of that. Uh, and it has a, you know, a huge impact that will come up in future games. This, you know, the story does not end with this game. Uh, you're you're and, getting to my uh, next question. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you will meet the character that's in that painting. Uh, but uh, it's you know it all goes into uh, this uh, this website, the Half Wittenberg Door, and people that were role playing on that website uh, contributed ideas to the game, and uh, we have built all that into the world. So it, you guys are uh, so you know, good to your fans. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> so you know it could be say, oh yeah, fan service, but no, it's not about fan service. No. Our, our our fans are all writers too. They all they're all creative people. Uh, that have good ideas, and you know we we try to unify it so it all works together. Uh, but it's all there, you know. It's a, it's all one world. What it's, makes sorry. a great game is the synergy of the people who work on it. Uh -huh. So all of the the best of the Quest for Glory games had people working together, all doing it out of a love for the game and really contributing to the whole ideas, uh, monsters. Uh, the humor of the game came because of our programmer that was working for us at the time. And all of these things became part of the whole. Likewise yeah. with Hero U, people, the fans that contributed, team members that contributed, all of that made the game what it is. Yeah, one of our uh, Sierra artists, uh, Jerry Moore, was a huge Star Trek fan. Uh, he was particularly uh, Star Trek Next Gen, but mm -hmm. you know he liked the whole series. Uh, and of course, Lori and I, uh, you know, grew up on Star Trek and uh, uh, the original series and loved it, uh, and watched Next Gen with our friends and so on. Uh, and so uh, Jerry made sure that every game he worked on, which included some King's Quests and Police Quests and our game and so on, uh, always had somewhere in the game the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's at least two places, if not more, in Quest for Glory. Uh, if not more, if not Jerry Moore. Uh, I've so, got to think about uh, that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, the whole thing at the end of Heroes Quest slash Quest for Glory One, uh, which is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the crazy maze that uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know you fall through trap doors and everything else. Uh, uh, that was that was kind of put together by uh, you know. A, couple of the artists working uh, in coordination with the programmers to make... It was really just Jerry Moore. Okay, so, so basically <laughs> Jerry Moore again did that. Uh, the uh, uh, Mage's Maze minigame in uh, Quest for Glory 1 was uh, designed by Ken Nishue, who was uh, our lead artist on 2 and uh, worked on uh, 1 with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I had drawn that out as a, a flat thing and, you know, kind of a simple little uh, pathway and stuff. And Ken turned that into a, uh, you know, a, a pseudo 3D environment uh, that really brought it life. And so you can have all the, uh, you know, all the game design and the mechanics and so on, but it doesn't come to life until the, the artwork and the music and the programming all come together and make it work. So, you know, we may have been the game designers in all these games, but it's the teams that made them. Absolutely. And I mean, you can tell the, like you said, the synergy and going back to what you said, the heart, those games, you know, the quest games and hero you, you can tell are made by people that loved what they were working on and it really comes through. And it's why I'm very glad, you know, that, that you've mentioned that, you know, hero you is, is, you know, the tip of an iceberg, you know, the, the a beginning point, um, would you, you know, want to share or discuss uh, future plans for Hero U with uh, some of the fans that might be listening, like this one? 
Well, well our next project <laughs> is a kind of any game kind of thing compared to this. It's not mm -hmm. a, it's a pure adventure story tale um, that takes place the semester before Rogue to Rock. It takes place in the summertime and it's called Summer Days at Hero U. Ooh. And, uh, yeah, it's designed in the style of, uh, uh, like, dating games like Dream Daddy. Oh, um, get out. But it's, uh, but it's not really a dating game. But it, what it is is it's a more casual game that is uh, really uh, Hero You boiled down to its essence. Okay. You mentioned the key thing on Hero You is all the characters and uh, uh, relationships and so on. And that's what this game is, is that... Uh, uh, there's no no little figure walking around. You have still screens, mm -hmm. uh, and then we have dialogue uh, going up over the still screen, and you're making the same kind of choices you make in the Hero You dialogue, but it's all very uh, very focused and intense, uh, and it's all, you know, uh, uh, learning about the characters and establishing relations. Uh, the uh, the storyline, uh, we're actually going to have uh, two different protagonists. Okay. Uh, so you can start as either the... Uh, uh, the female rogue or the male wizard. Ooh. Uh, and uh, and uh, you will play through this game. And uh, uh, in either case, your uh, your goal sort of is to uh, uh, get the fall festival to be a success. Okay. So the game uh, takes place in summer. Uh, and you're working and trying to uh, do everything you need to make this uh, fall festival happen. While everything else is going on at the school and you're taking classes and you know, dealing with other characters and with, you know, school administrators and everything else. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so it really is a, uh, uh, you know, very intense, boiled down to its essence, uh, uh, character study game on these characters. Oh, I'm excited. Uh, and of course, the same beautiful art and uh, original music and so on. And hopefully can be, you know, out for five years from now. <laughs> Which is the reason we're making it, you know, this kind of game. Well, and then our plans are for after this to do Wizard Way, which is is, uh, is the direct sequel to. Uh, I Rumpley think she means less than four to five years. From okay, now. well, maybe. Yeah, we're, we're trying <laughs> to get well, some, trying to get summer days out uh, I next said, year. So it doesn't take more than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll keep my uh, fingers crossed. That that sounds great. And uh, if that's uh, any kind of a success, uh, and you know we'll do some more Kickstarters and such, uh, then hopefully we'll have the funding to uh, go on to the game that we promised as the second game originally, which was uh, Hero You Wizard's Way, um, and that's the uh, uh, the Wizard School variation on uh, Rogue Redemption. Uh, so yes, we have a plan to do the complete series of the uh, uh, Rogue to Redemption Wizard's Way. A warrior game, pally, paladin game, and a culmination game. Uh, that's the serious game style that we're planning on. But then we'll be doing a lot of little smaller scale games with different styles. Because honestly, we have a lot of, uh, we love a lot of different kinds of games. And we want to make things that come out in a shorter schedule so they're more practical. Sure. So what we haven't learned how to do is uh, how to uh, pay a team of 30 people uh, for several years uh, on a few hundred thousand dollars uh, total. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we're going with uh, uh, Summer Days is a much smaller team. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing it with uh, basically five people. Okay. Uh, and uh, we're going to try and get it done in a year and a half. Uh, and hopefully, uh, uh, you know, that will be successful enough and we'll, you know, do Kickstarters and such. But uh, you know, it is really hard to justify doing huge games when uh, uh, people play them, love them, but not many people actually ever look, ever hear about it or uh, you know or uh, you know buy it on uh, Steam or uh, GOG. Wow. Um, so uh, so it's tough. Uh, you know, or uh, sort of like uh, the the old expression of uh, you know my eyes are bigger than my stomach. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Looking at tasty food, uh, so this one, uh, our plans are bigger than our budget. Right, understandable. Well, hopefully this will help with that a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, God, I hope so. That just, I, I love the plans. Like, I love what what you're describing, and I, I can't wait to play Summer Days. That sounds like something I would really enjoy. And um, 
I guess, you know, you guys really have your, your icons in this industry. I mean, you, you've been there for, for kind of its very early beginnings up to now. And, uh, would you have any advice for future, you know, game designers or writers or creative people that, you know, are, are considering getting into some kind of game design? I'm giving two opposite pieces of advice. Uh, one is follow your passion, do what you love. Uh, uh, but the big piece of advice is you've got to understand that making a game is a lot different from playing it. Yep. And it is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Uh, you're going to be, you know, spending many, many intensive hours. You're going to uh, get burned out. You're going to be frustrated. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, if you're not going through that, then, uh, you know, maybe you're just an amazingly balanced person, but more likely you're not putting in enough work. Uh, so uh, making games is really hard. It really takes a lot of time. Uh, and then if you uh, are foolish enough to re read the reviews afterwards, uh, <laughs> uh, this day of, in this day and age, you find people uh, either entirely love something or entirely hate it, and you know it's like uh, uh, they entirely love it for 20 hours, and then they hit one thing they don't like, and all of a sudden the flip switches, and they hate everything about it. Uh, and you'll be reading that and despairing. Uh, so uh, the other side of it is, you know, so uh, do what you love, but you know, don't think you're going to, you know, make the next uh, World of Warcraft and get uh, instantly rich on it. Because, uh, in fact, Blizzard didn't do that. They yeah. were working on games for 15 or 20 years before they came out with World of Warcraft. Yep. Uh, and they had a lot of successes, but they also had some uh, not so much. Yeah. Uh, so this is, this is hard. It's a very hard industry. Uh, probably uh, there's two ways to go about it. One is, uh, you know, if you can afford to make as much as you can on your own, make, you know, make paper prototypes, uh, make uh, tabletop games and play with your friends and so on. Uh, make simple uh, games with uh, Unity is free. Yep. Uh, uh, but it'll take hundreds of hours to learn to get good at it. Just like uh, Lori uses Photoshop with uh, for artwork, uh, she spent you know literally thousands of hours learning her skills on Photoshop to, work, mm -hmm. to get where she is now. And it makes it look effortless now, but it, it didn't start out that way. So uh, you know, put in the work, put in the time, and then your other way to do it is to uh, you know is to basically uh, learn the everything you can on the basic skills. Learn to teach. Uh, learn to uh, you know write well. Uh, take uh, creative writing classes. Learn to program. Learn to do art. Any or all of those, and then get a job for existing uh, you know one of the big gaming companies like uh, not like Blizzard or Activision or Electronic Arts, uh, and learn your skills. Yeah. Um, and one of that skill that you really need to develop, and you may not think about if you're going to college and that. Speaking skill, communication skills. It's huge. You are going to have to communicate. Whether you're designing a game or working on a team, you have to know how to talk to people and get them to work together. And so leadership skills and communication skills, these things are critical for this industry. Yeah, when Lori uh, started as uh, directing uh, Hero You. Uh, you know, they had this concept of a, uh, a game director that was just, we looked at the scripts of that and said, nobody exists who could do this job because <laughs> you needed, you needed to be a, a team leader. You had to have management experience. Uh, you had to be a, a superior writer. Uh, you had to understand games and be a good game designer and a puzzle designer. Uh, you had to have art skills so that you could work with the artists and so you could, uh, you know, draw sketches and prototype things. You had to have programming skills uh, so that you could, uh, uh, you know, make the stuff actually work and talk with a team of programmers that didn't necessarily uh, speak English as you or I would. Uh, and, you know, just this entire set of skills. You needed music and uh, skills and so on. And uh, we said nobody, nobody actually has all this, but it kind of turned out we did. Mm -hmm. uh, and we spent, you know, 30 years or, you know, 20 years building up uh, to work at Sierra without ever knowing it. Uh, yeah. Lori's uh, background is uh, she had a degree in education and uh, taught uh, preschool and elementary school. Uh, she had a minor in art. Uh, uh, she didn't know programming, but she was married to a programmer. Uh, <laughs> and I had already worked for more than 10 years as a programmer before I got into Sierra. Uh, uh, and uh, both of us took uh, animation classes at uh, junior college, dance college. 
Uh, and so we knew a little bit about uh, traditional uh, Disney style animation uh, techniques, cell animation. And uh, so we had all these bits and pieces that we came together, we suddenly discovered uh, were what it took to be a, a game director at Sierra. So it's just, you know, in a sense, an amazing coincidence, but in another sense, uh, you know, is that this is what we always wanted to do. We grew up in games, we grew up on uh, fantasy, we grew up on uh, mythology and reading extensively. And, uh, and, you know, we wanted to make these things, uh, to bring these things to life. Yeah, effectively creating games was the culmination of our life and yeah. all our interests. Yeah. I mean, it, wow. It, it's just, it's incredible you know, you know, people always say certain professions are, you know, a calling or, or it's, you know, and it, it's, it's hard to explain it that way, but it really is something you have to love to do and you have to really put in the time. And obviously you guys have, have done that and then some, and, um, again, your, your impact on this industry can't really be understated. And so, um, again, I, I hope, uh, hero you and, and summer days again, if, uh, if you guys keep us in the loop, we'll push it for sure. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to thank That's you both. Very cool. I, I thank you both so much for your time and for sitting down and, and talking with us and uh, sharing your past and, and the future, you know, as far as Hero U goes. And, um, I, yeah, just best of luck, and I can't wait to hear more. I, I hope to have you guys on uh, when you're getting ready to release uh, Summer Days, and we'll we'll talk about it some more. and. Get the word out there. Well, thank you. And uh, you know, we, we could, in a sense, get a, a swollen heads from all this, uh, all this praise, and we, we do get, <laughs> get this a lot. Uh, but at the same time, we know that we're really just people that uh, you know ended up at the right place at the right time and doing something we love. Uh, and we also know that we have plenty of critics and haters to uh, balance out the equation. And sometimes <laughs> they're the same person. Some of our uh, staunchest fans turn into our biggest critics when. Uh, <laughs> You know, we uh, we say, uh, uh, well, sorry, we can't do that thing you want. And they say, you can't. Well, then you're worthless. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, that's what I say. We're in a we're in a very divided world right now where there's nothing yeah. in between love and hate. Uh, so. But the thing, the advice we really give everybody is, you know, keep keep the faith in yourself. You know, it's a hard industry. Uh, anything is difficult, but you really have to keep working at it. The only way to fail is to quit. Yep. You have to keep going. And uh, use your mistakes and your problems to learn because you only get better. Yeah. yeah we, Absolutely. We, we, have a few, uh, uh, we have a few CPA, Certified Public Accountant jokes in Hero U. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny because I realized after a while that an awful lot of my job uh, amounts to being uh, accounting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the fact is, you can love whatever you do. You can you can love doing accounting. I've had some really creative tax accountants that uh, uh, just reveled in uh, being able to find every little uh, uh, trick they could do with the tax code to save uh, their <laughs> the clients money. Uh, and uh, you know, you can love being a janitor. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the one of the guys I worked with, who was a, a great writer, uh, worked his day job as uh, 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 worked uh, running uh, like milling machines and such. And, his job basically was to babysit these machines that every once in a while would break down and then uh, uh, try to make sure that they didn't destroy all the uh, uh, the materials uh, when they broke <laughs> down. Uh, and in between that, he sat in his uh, office and, uh, and wrote. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can love anything you do, and gaming, uh, game creation is just one of them. Uh, uh, so if you've got that creative spark to you and, you, you know, you want to tell stories and you want to tell interactive stories, it's a great industry to be in. Uh, but... Man, you're going to work at it if you want to do it right. If you get lazy, it won't be good. <laughs> that is great advice. I think that could be said for any creative profession. It really uh, is, but, you know. Well, and thanks. By the way, all, all professions are creative. Yes. That's a good point. That is a good point. But thank you both so much. This was a lot of fun. And, um, I again, I can't wait to see what you guys do next. Thanks a lot. We'll do our best. We're looking forward to it, too. <laughs> I can tell you so far, the art that's come in uh, for uh, Summer Days is awesome. Uh, you know, JP's out doing himself. We've got some great characters and great background scenes. Um, and, 
Uh, it's more like a children's uh, storybook style as far as the uh, art Ooh. and such. It's, uh, you know, it's abstract, 2D, uh, but uh, it just looks awesome. Uh, we have a new musician working in the project. You know, we absolutely love uh, the work uh, Ryan uh, Grogan did, but, uh, uh, you know, another uh, uh, fan came in with an offer we couldn't refuse, and uh, he's doing great work for us. So we're going to have uh, a lot, a lot of... Uh, you know, detailed input, uh, working with them every week uh, on stuff. So I think the uh, uh, the soundscape for the game is going to be great. Oh, by the way, for uh, Rogue Redemption, we're not done with it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're, we first of all uh, went through uh, five patches on and went to version 1.5, which is what's currently on Steam and GOG. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting ready to uh, release it on uh, Fireflower Games for the European audience. Oh, great. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I'm probably going to put it up on itch.io. I've got some other uh, queries out. Uh, and we're working on translations to French, German, and simplified Chinese. Oh, great. Uh, and uh, if those go well, we may do other, other languages as well. But uh, that was already kind of beyond our budget to do those. But uh, we said, hey, you know, we've got to get this game out of more languages than English. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of stuff coming down the pike, even with this game. Uh, May 4th, uh, Lori and I are doing a live stream on YouTube. Uh, oh, cool. which uh, you should go visit our uh, uh, our Facebook pages. Uh, search for uh, uh, Facebook slash The School for Heroes. Okay. It is, Facebook.com slash The School for Heroes. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a good place to keep up with uh, what's new in it. So we got uh, we got our uh, all our irons in the fire. That's awesome. And uh, I'm going to have to jump on that. I didn't realize that was on there. That's perfect. Yeah. Oh, and uh, hero dash u letter u hero dash letter u dot com uh, is our uh, website for the game, uh, and we occasionally uh, blog there, uh, and that's got links to the Facebook pages and stuff, and uh, where you can buy the game too. Yeah, and and for people, you know, for our listeners, uh, again, I I can't recommend Hero U enough. If you enjoyed the quest games and you want to play something that is serious in the spirit of those games you know and this you know same good humor and the same heart i i think Corey said it best there's a lot of heart to this game and it is really fun so if if uh you've been if you haven't heard of it and you enjoyed those games in the past you you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't check it out uh like you said you can get it on gog you can get it on steam and it's coming to other you know avenues like he said so Keep an eye out for those. Um, go check the the Facebook page, uh, the, slash the School for Heroes, and um, yeah, we'll we'll be we'll be waiting for uh, any news we can get on more of the world of Hero U. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, have a great weekend, and uh, again, really appreciate your time. Yes, thank you so much. It was enjoyable. Thanks, Thanks a lot. A lot. Yeah. We love talking about this stuff. It's, uh, you know, we haven't, uh, haven't written our uh, bio, uh, biopsy, bioptics, whatever they're called. <laughs> Autobiography. I haven't taken a biopsy on this. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so these things are the only history we, uh, that we're creating. I really appreciate so, being a part of it. Well, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. And have fun. Thanks, you guys. Thank you again, everybody, for listening to the interview with the Coles. Uh, they were fantastic, as I'm sure you've heard. And they had some really good advice. And normally I don't like to finish these off like this, but I think it's important that if you want to get into game design, or any creative profession really, uh, you're going to hit the hard spots. It's going to be incredibly difficult, but if it's something you want to do and do for a living, you've got to stick to it. I think that's really good advice in any profession. And... Um, yeah, I don't know. This was a great interview, kind of eye-opening, and just wonderful to talk to people that were, you know, for all aspects, growing up, some of my heroes. So again, I hope you all enjoyed it, and we will catch you next week on a regular episode of the Retro Rents. Till then, everybody, keep gaming, have fun, and catch everybody later. Later.